Welcome to this very special session for FC Insiders, our new premium members and selected other members of the firm's consulting community. My name is Chris Safarova. As you know, I am a founder and CEO of firmsconsulting.com and strategytraining.com. Joining us today is Simon Mannering. Simon is a founder and CEO of VFIRST, a successful, I must say very successful, strategic consultancy firm in Los Angeles that serves clients like Sony Pictures, SAP, Coca-Cola, California Pizza Kitchen, among many others. Simon is also a New York Times bestselling author and a global thought leader who has helped businesses like Starbucks, Zara, and Disney grow by becoming purpose-driven, which you guys know is very important for firms consulting. So there's this unique, amazing alignment between the work Simon is doing and we are doing. So what we are going to do is Simon is going to do a workshop for about 40 minutes. This is a unique opportunity to learn from someone who achieved significant milestones in his career and is willing to teach you on this workshop. And just like with all our content, this type of live workshop has the potential to give you one distinction, one idea, one solution that can change everything for you and your family. So get out your notebook and the pen or open your Google Word doc or Evernote, however you take notes and make sure you actively listen and note down specific steps you can take on Monday morning at 8 a.m. after this workshop is over or tomorrow at 8 a.m. so that you can get results. As we go through the workshop, if you have any questions, type them in the chat and we will select some questions at the end for our Q&A. So engage, ask questions in the chat. General rules of engagement, just two. Number one, keep it positive at all times. We want it to be solution-oriented, action-oriented, inspiring and motivating call for our community. And number two is keep it brief so we can cover more during Q&A section. So I'll pass it over to you, Simon. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to meet everybody. And thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world, New York City, Russia, Melbourne, Singapore. I see all those names there and thank you so much. And it's a real privilege to share some of the thinking around my new book, Lead With We, with you today. So let me dive in and I'm gonna share my screen. And this is always the greatest challenge for any presenter is to make sure that they actually get up on screen successfully. So Chris, how are we looking? Has it gone up there okay? Very good. We can see you and we can see your presentation. Fantastic. And let's dive in. I mean, why are we talking today? We're talking today because I think if you're watching COP26 last week, if you've been looking at the headlines over the last year, if you've been, you know, like everyone going through COVID-19, you realize that in different ways we're in trouble right now. And we worry for our businesses, we worry for our future, we worry for our kids' future. In fact, what's so unique about this moment in time is that all of us are challenged to grow our businesses at the same time when we realize we've got to solve some of these social environmental crises like Code Red for Humanity with the environment, you know, the uh, climate emergency, COVID-19, social unrest on so many different levels and social inequities. And, you know, here in the United States and around the world, the supply chain problems we have right now, they're all interrelated. And the thing that's really preoccupied my mind as somebody who spent the last 10 years working with startups, private equity, venture back companies, Tom's, Timberland, and these large, large enterprises is business is not moving far enough, fast enough. We're not moving and changing what we're doing in a way that's going to solve for these issues. And these issues aren't sitting there statically in the future, just waiting for us to arrive. They're compounding, they're getting bigger, they're interrelated, and they're hurtling back towards us in the present. And here's what's coming based on my experience and all the different clients that we get to see and what I hear in all the boardrooms. There is a hockey stick of expectation coming where even five years ago, only a small proportion of businesses were being purposeful. 
Now, especially due to COVID, even more companies are talking about their role in the world. As these issues get more and more serious, it's going to go vertical. And why is that important to you? The expectation on your company, your leadership, your products from employees, customers, and investors is going to increase. And the question they're going to be asking you, consciously or not, is are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? Why? Because they're feeling it in their daily lives. Extreme weather, fires in Australia, fires in California, grease on fire, floods in Western Europe. You know, all of these issues, as well as supply chain issues and, you know, the great resignation, talent leaving, and all of these different er areas are going to impact your business. And in my opinion, the luxury of how far and how fast you change is soon going to be ripped out of your hands because the expectation will go through the roof. And so the point of the discussion today is to share with you what I think companies large and small need to do to get ready for that, to position themselves to be ahead of that so that as these market forces come through and reward those companies that are doing more good, it can push you forward. It can drive your growth, even as you solve for these issues that are threatening our future. And I have to say on a personal note, as sad as it is, the circumstances we're in, it's a very, very special time to be in business where we can do meaningful work in business, but it's doubly meaningful because it can solve for our future. And that is really fulfilling for all of us because all of us want our time to have some significance, some meaning. So let's dive into what this looks like. As I said, I spent the last three or four years thinking about how do we accelerate and scale our change? And this week is a special week for me. You know, my new book, Lead With We, which is now up on Amazon, came out and it's available there for you to grab or you can go to leadwithwe.com. And if you see here, the big idea in the book that is going to drive your business growth and your impact is what I call the virtuous spiral of collectivized purpose. What does that mean? For a long time, if you're a purposeful company, you want to do good. You've heard about this idea of the virtuous cycle. You do well by doing good. But after 10 years of working with leading purposeful companies, I've, I see a problem. The vast majority of business out there in the world is still just looking after itself, just looking after its bottom line at the cost of its people and the planet. And then there's like stars in the sky. There's this growing number of purposeful companies, but each one of those companies can't change the, the future on their own. Yet there's not the connective tissue between all of these different companies. And so how do we expand that connective tissue? How do we make sure your efforts and my efforts and Chris's efforts and all of our efforts unlock the synergies, the compounding effect, so we scale and accelerate our response to these crises we face? And that's why I talk about a virtuous spiral where you've got these different layers up through society rather than the cycle. And the reason the cycle is problematic is that I've noticed that companies increasingly limit their impact to the stakeholders closest into them. They work with their employees, their suppliers, their customers, but they don't reach far enough and they don't partner and collaborate enough to start to get those synergies and compounding effect. And so you've got to go to the virtuous spiral rather than cycle. And when you do that, you can practice what I call collectivized purpose. You in Russia, you in Melbourne, you in New York, you have your own unique purpose for your company, as do I at We First. But business itself has a larger purpose, which is to restore, regenerate and protect the natural and social systems on which all of our futures depend. Why? Because brands can't survive in societies that fail. And right now, the whole is breaking down. The natural environment is breaking down. Our social systems are breaking down. There's greater disparity of wealth than ever. There's more social inequities. There's more homelessness. And your business can't thrive in this environment, especially as it gets worse. So we're going to look at each level of the spiral. And my hope for you today is to realize that the more you open your mind to how you can accelerate and scale your impact at a time when these issues are getting worse, the more the market will reward you 
and investors, consumers, and employees will grow your business with you because they want to work for, buy from, and invest in companies doing good. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's start at the bottom with me. And why is it important to start there? Well, we got into this mess together. What I did, what Simon did, the car I drive, the companies I work for, the diet I had, where I put my money, and you as well. Every single one of us did all of these little actions in our daily lives that led to this collective result. Plastic in the oceans, carbon in the air, chemicals in the soil. All of us are complicit in that. The only way out of it, out of it is if we all show up. So my problem with this dialogue around the shift from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, where you know everyone wants a stake in the rewards of capitalism, is that we not only get to share the rewards, but we also need to share the responsibilities. And what I mean by that is just ask yourself this. Do we think that we're going to solve for the climate and plastic and all these other issues if you don't change, if I don't change, if Chris doesn't change, and we sit there and wait for some billionaire, one industry, one company, or the government to fix it? Do we think that's going to work? I don't think it's going to work. We have billions of people around the world creating the problem and making it worse every day. And we all have to show up differently. And you might say to me, come on, Simon, we get that. I understand that intellectually. It's never going to happen. People are too lazy and too selfish. But here's the fact. In a moment of crisis, people show up differently. Just think about COVID-19. In February last year, if I told you that most companies around the world would re-engineer their supply chains to make PPE equipment, you know, restaurants would make free meals for medical practitioners and first responders, you know, companies would be making ventilators, everyone would send their people home. You would never have believed me. But the pandemic forced us to show up differently. And the climate emergency, loss of biodiversity, the plastic problem, social inequities are going to be equally acute. Just look at the Black Lives Matter movement last year. And so the point here is that each of us, you, I, we all need to show up and say, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to look at what I buy, what car I drive, my diet, what bank I put my money in, what companies I put my stocks in, my investments in and recognize that each one of those decisions is a vote on a certain type of future. Because if we don't, things will continue to get worse and we only have ourselves to blame. So we've got to recognize this new reality, grasp the urgency and shift our thinking. And if you might say, why would we do that? Well, the reality is this, it, it'd be great if we could leave it to the next generation. It would be great if we could wait another 10 years. But Buckminster Fuller started talking about this in the 1950s. And we kicked the can down the road in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2010s. And here we are in 2020. And the UN and heads of state at COP26 said this is code red for humanity, that the results will be catastrophic in our lifetimes. And that right now, if you look at the climate commitments, the carbon reduction commitments of companies and countries around the world, we are on track for a 2.4 degrees Celsius rise in temperature, which is going to be catastrophic. That's their words, not mine. What's interesting too, and I have a dad, I'm a dad, I have two daughters, Aisha and Talia, and they're 22 and 19, just outside that door. And they have told me they're not sure if they want to have kids because they're worried about the future. Do they want to bring somebody into this world? And in fact, you know, the, the Lancet um, Planetary Health Report came out a few weeks ago and said that 56% of 16 to 25 year olds think humanity is doomed. If you have a kid, think about that. If you have a child in that age group, if you have a child that's younger, this is their life, their future, the choices we made in the past but more importantly, the choices we make today will determine just how extreme their experience of life is. So that's why the stakes are so high. That's why we need to show up now. That's why we can't wait another 10 years. We've done that for five or six gen uh, decades now. So here's a question for you. And I want to all the way through this, 
ask you certain questions you can jot down the answers to so you walk away with something you can put to work tomorrow. The first question is, what is one action you personally can take to advance positive change in your life or inside your company? Example, you might choose to buy an electric vehicle. You might choose to transition some of your diet or all of your diet to plant-based, to, you know, to meat alternatives. You may choose to look at the bank you bank with and see where they put their dollars to see if they're investing them in the oil and gas industry. You may look to see, oh, what companies am I investing in with my retirement or 401k you know, fund? And you know, are they the type of companies that are on the right side of history for our future? What is one simple action you can take? For example, I transitioned to a plant-based diet. I'm an Australian. I grew up eating meat. I loved it. It's part of the Australian culture, but I made the choice and I feel a lot better for it, sure, but I made the choice because I wanted to show up in a meaningful way. Just one example. Then above and beyond that first question, and just jot that down, let's go up to the next level up the spiral. And this is the leadership level, leadership level. Now that could mean you're a CEO, or it could mean you're a solopreneur or a founder of a startup. But it also could mean you work in marketing or payroll or R&D or a supplier inside a company. Anyone is a leader when they choose to lead. And in our work over the last 10 years at WeFirst, we've found that most impact movements start not with the CEO, but with an internal champion inside the company that wants to make a difference and they build consensus inside the company. So you've got to define your company purpose and goals. What does this look like? Well, to do that, you've got to do an honest audit of your company. You've got to look at your company and go, are our suppliers good? Where are they sourcing their materials? Are they putting chemicals into rivers? Are they harming the environment? Are they creating you know, deforestation and loss of habitat? And look for those partners that, are better ser that better serve our future. And then you've got to define what your reason for being is, why you exist as a company. And this is not just about doing good in the world. This is about being on the right side of market forces so that as things get worse in the next five to 10 years, your company doesn't take a hit because there's many companies that are going to be put out of business because they're either doing the wrong thing or they're not telling others about the good work they're doing. And as you see from the Wall Street Journal here, all the research is showing that CEOs that ignore social issues will do so at their peril because investors won't put their money in you, employees won't work for you, and consumers won't buy from you. Let's look at an example of what leadership looks like. And this is a dramatic example. I mean, Nestle, the largest food company in the world with over 2,300 brands, just recently announced Generation Regeneration, which is their very large financial and time commitment to transform their supply chains all around the world to regenerative practices by working with small holding farmers all around the world. And they're going to have to absorb that cost and invest that time but they're doing it because they, they want to be on the right side of history. They want to be defensible. They want to de-risk their company. And to that end, they are doing the work. And it's also a very powerful signal to the marketplace that things need to change. If you're a food company and you see Nestle, the largest food company in the world with brands everyone has in their cupboard, changing fundamentally what they're doing, there's got to be an important reason behind it. Or you look at the largest retailer in the world, Walmart, that just recently announced Project Gigaton, whose goal is to pull a gigaton of greenhouse gas emissions, a billion tons out of the atmosphere. And they give the equivalence, that's 6 million you know, blue whales, that's 211 million cars off the road within a year. You know, all the, you know, the, the, the weight of 100 million elephants, that's how much carbon they're pulling out of, out of the air. Again, the largest retailer in the world is now working in a lead with we way with their suppliers to be more responsible for our future, to protect the company, to make sure its products and its brand can survive in the marketplace and to restore our future. So second question, what is one big area of potential improvement in your company? You all know it, just first thing that comes to mind. 
is it your suppliers? You don't really look at it. You know that they're not so good, or you don't know, you know, tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers, where they're getting their materials from. Or is it your culture? You're not really diverse and you're not inclusive. So how do you do a better job on the D&I front inside your company? Or is it your products? The products you're taking to market are actually just a lot of plastic and they're not good for people or there's a lot of plastic in the packaging. I'll tell you an example. There's an, an apparel company here in California called Prana and they wanted to get the plastic out of their packaging because they saw that when people opened up their deliveries to their door, there was just plastic everywhere. Everything was wrapped in plastic. So they redesigned their packaging through folding that they didn't need to use so much plastic. In one year, starting at the end of 2019, they took 10 million plastic bags out of their supply chain. This is a mid-sized company, a 30 year old mid-sized company. They then thought, well, what if we showed this idea, this technology to other people? And they invited other companies to join what they called the responsible packaging movement. There are now 106 companies as part of this movement. So let's just do the math. 10 million plastic bags in one mid-sized company joined by 100 plus other companies. That's how much plastic is being taken out of people's supply chain. Extraordinary. What is one big area of potential improvement in your company? And then make a commitment to talk about that next week with you know, your co-founder, your, your C-suite, whoever it might be. Then going up this virtuous spiral to the next level, you wanna make sure that your company is aligned around that purpose. And you've got to make sure that you mobilize internal stakeholders. So this is about applying your purpose throughout the company, whether you're an exec, an employee, and through your supply chain. So what's an example, or why is this important? This came out just in the last month. Just Capital, Forbes, you know, Fortune Magazine, they're all starting to rank companies based on how they treat their employees. Why? Because a big issue in the United States and around the world is a fair and living wage. Why? Because diversity and inclusion is so important. Why? Because if you're doing the wrong thing, it's not just the media or consumers that will expose you, it's your own employees. And you've seen that with Apple, you've seen it with Amazon, you've seen it with Google, and you've seen it with Facebook just in the last year over women's empowerment, pay scales, gender bias, climate response. So you've got to make sure that your company is defensible internally. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Santander, the bank, has actually created a special financing program for the suppliers of Tesco, giving them preferential financing rates, loans and interest rates based on their environmental footprint. So the more responsible you are as a supplier, the less interest you pay on a loan. So this is a partnership between a bank, suppliers and Tesco. Powerful stuff, everyone benefits. Or look at Deloitte, one of the largest consulting firms in the world. Just a couple of months ago, three months ago, they announced they're actually training their 330,000 employees on the climate crisis so they can better serve their clients, which is almost every major brand around the world. They're investing in their people. They're bringing their own purpose to life inside their company and investing in educating their employees. Or look at you know COVID-19. Companies were taking care of their employees in ways that were unimaginable before. Look at Starbucks that actually gave free therapy sessions and catastrophe pay to its employees to get through the crisis. And this is a new dimension for brands that they've got to show up almost like a first responder. They've got to look after their employees, their culture in much more tangible ways when a crisis hits. And I'm telling you sadly that in the last year, we've had the climate crisis, COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement, and there are going to be more and more crises in the future because the die is already cast. These things are already set. And so with all of that in mind, here's a question for you. What is one change you can help to make purpose a living and breathing force inside your company? Could you sit down with your employees and have a brainstorming session about how to bring your purpose to life? Could you talk to your suppliers and say, how do we get plastic out of our supply chain? Could you think with your HR department or chief people officer and say, hey, could we do a volunteering day once every six months? And let's ask the employees what they want us to volunteer around. 
all of these are different ways to rally your employees to strengthen your culture at a time when the great resignation is going on here in the US, at a time when people are really reconsidering what's important in life and where do they want to invest their time and who do they want to work for. Let's go one further level up the spiral. Remember, we've gone from me, I choose to lead, to leaders inside a company, the, the founder, the CEO, somebody inside the company that chooses to lead. Then you've gone into the internal culture of that company and you're co-creating impact. This is going out to marketing, externally, out to the world, with your customers and consumers. I don't call it marketing, although I was an ad guy for 15 years. I call it community architecture where you build a community that's going to build your business with you. And so you've really got to mobilize your community. You've got to build a brand movement to drive change. And this is for customers, this is for consumers, and this is for partners. You're going to lead a movement. What does that look like? Well, here's an example of that packaging movement I talked about, the responsible packaging movement. And it's a prana here. You can see the spelling P-R-A-N-A. And they literally say, we are going to make a movement, a sustainability movement, and they're welcoming, welcoming other members, other companies into the Prana family. Or look at Ikea in Europe. Just in the last month or so, they not only allowed European customers to, to bring their old furniture back and Ikea would buy it back so that they could have a circular economy and create less waste, but they've also now started to offer renewable energy in Europe so that the customer's households can become climate positive. So when did an, an, an affordable furniture maker suddenly start selling renewable energy? They did it when they realized that the furniture industry is a huge polluter and that damages their reputation. And people increasingly are starting to think, I don't want to buy from Ikea and people don't want to work for Ikea. And by doing this, they reposition the brand as a platform on which all their customers, employees, investors can stand and help create a regenerative future. So they're shoring up their own business at the same time as they're bettering our future. Or another great example here, a very small new company here in California. It's called Eat the Change. And it, it was started by the, chair, the chairperson of Beyond Meat. And it's a, a, a meat alternative, a plant-based company and they said, well, listen, we want to change consumer habits. We want to work with our consumers, with customers out there and help them develop new habits. Now, we're not going to tell them what to do. No one likes that. But we're going to give them a small experience in what that looks like. So they created the incredible plant challenge and they created a calendar for one month where each day you got to have one slight adjustment in your diet, your eating habits. So day one, swap animal milk for plant milk, like a pea protein or almond milk. And also you can see on the right there, they actually laid out what the impact of that was, what the equivalent of participating in that challenge was, the difference you were making. And they had 28 days, 29 days across a whole month. And that trained people that it wasn't bad tasting, that it wasn't sacrificing too much to shift or transition to a partly or fully based plant-based diet. So what is one question at the community level, your customers, if you're in Russia, if you're in Sydney, if you're in New York, B2B, B2C, what is one way that you can co-create impact with your customers or consumers? Do you reach out to them and ask them, hey, we'd like to improve our products. What's the suggestion you have? Or do you reach out to them and say, you know, we'd like to generate donations for, you know, our climate emergency funds and we'll match your donations. Or do you actually ask them and say, who's someone we could partner with to scale our impact? Is there another organization out there that would like to partner with us so that we can co-create the impact together? I'll give you an example. Dove soap. There's no more commodity product out there than soap. It's all the same stuff with different fragrances. Yet recently Dove, whose purpose is to make beauty a source of confidence, not anxiety, reached out to women, its customers and said, can you send us in a photo of you, a real woman, unretouched, so we can create a new stock library of photography of real women, unretouched, so that they can make those available to advertisers around the world for free? 
Why is that important? Because their purpose is to make beauty a source of confidence, not anxiety. They wanted to overcome the sexualization and objectification of women. And so they worked with their customers, the women around the world who shared their photos to create this library. What do you think those women felt about the brand? They felt it was authentic. They felt like they were part of the process and it just deepened their loyalty to buying Dove soap. And then we're getting to that societal level. And I think wherever you are in the world, even if you're an Australian in Russia, as I saw there, you know, where, wherever you are in the world, you know, there are society issues that are unavoidable now. Here in the United States, we've seen same-sex marriage, gun control, abortion, access to voting rights. All of these issues are coming up all the time. And whether you like it or not as a brand, you've got to take a stand. You can't hide on the sidelines. All the research says that you'll be penalized for staying silent or not taking a stand on an issue. You've got to walk your own talk. So this is about collaborating cross sector and shaping culture. So what are those cultural conversations you can lead around these important issues? Immigration, whatever it might be. And what are the coalitions of partners that you can build? And so here are some examples. One of the biggest CPG consumer packaged goods companies in the world is Procter & Gamble. And there's probably no more sensitive issue that would put fear into the heart of any CEO or any CFO than racial bias, racial inequality, especially here in the United States. And yet they felt it was their responsibility, given all the lives they touch and all the people they serve and all the communities they work in to address the issue. And so they took the idea, you know, the, the issue head on and created, you know, the look, this campaign around racial bias in America, the look that white people give black people and people of color. And they took the issue head on. They received a lot of earned media, a lot of dialogue in the press about a brand taking this on and the substantive issues related to it. And it created a very powerful positive halo effect for the brand. And this is a company that has so much to lose. And this is such a sensitive issue. Or on the other side of the world, look at Tony's chocolate. I mean, Tony's chocolate has always been cheeky. But what they do is they have a very powerful platform in that they use cocoa that is free of slavery in their supply chain. But what they did was, if you have a look on the left here, Tony's went out and copied their competitors. Just think about this from a legal point of view or an IP point of view. They went out and copied Ferrero Rocher and Kit Kat and so on, copied their competitors' products, made their products and put them in Sainsbury stores. The legal teams must have just freaked out. They must have heard, what do you mean Tony's has copied our products and put it in stores? And the whole campaign was, Coco Industry, are you in? You know, if we can do it, so can you. If we can make chocolate free of slavery in your supply chain, you can too. And they got millions of dollars of earned media before the product was taken out of stores, but they put the industry on notice. Or back here in the United States, Harry's is a subscription razor ser service where you just get the razors in the mail. And they realized during COVID-19, they could make PPE equipment, they could make masks, but they asked themselves, what is the most authentic way that we could show up? And they decided, well, our target audience is young men. And young men have a high incidence of suicide, and that has gone up during COVID-19. So they decided to provide mental health support for young men, while others were making masks. It was authentic and relevant to their brand. And now they're built on that with the Open Minds Initiative, where they've, they have an open platform where they're reaching out to companies and nonprofits saying, how can we more effectively work together to solve the mental health issue? And so they're open sourcing the solution. So think about your brand for a second. And again, write down this answer. What is one conversation you can lead that's relevant to your brand? What category are you in? What products do you make? What are the issues that are relevant to it? What are your, what are your employees? What do your customers care about? What is that issue that you can speak to that if someone saw your brand talking about it, they go, oh, okay, I get that. That makes sense. Rather than trying to bolt on something that's not relevant to you. Write that down. What is one con cultural conversation you can lead? And then above and beyond those levels, there's me, there's the leaders, there's the company culture, there's the community, and there's a societal level. 
And all of these are building on each other. At the top, as you move from me to we, you've got the transcendent level. And that's just a fancy way of saying we've risen above all the limitations, self-imposed limitations of these lower levels. We're working them all together up the stack to create that connective tissue that I was talking about that's missing. Why? Because the vast majority of business is still doing business as usual and these different purposeful efforts aren't connecting and we're not getting where we need to go fast enough. And that's why we're working towards this transcendent level where we have a regenerative and abundant future. I actually read today that the Thames in London, the river, which has been considered biologically dead for so long, decades now, is actually coming back to life. The same thing happened with the Hudson in New York. The same thing happens with the clear skies when everyone stopped flying, you know, and the habitat started to regenerate and animals started coming back into city centers and so on. I mean, nature is inherently regenerative. And if we give it half a chance, it will come back and it will, will reward us. So we need to evolve the practices and principles that really align human and planetary health. You know, we can't survive if the natural world breaks down. Our life will just contract and diminish dramatically. A couple of examples. You know, I was lucky enough to be on the CAN jury this year for the Sustainable Development Goals. And we gave the Grand Prix to the 2030 calculator, which is a simple tool that allows any business owner to calculate the carbon footprint of the products they make so they can share that with consumers. Why is that important? You and I have been buying stuff that is more harmful than good. Why? Because we didn't know the damage that was being done. We weren't being told what's going on. And these tools, like Allbirds Carbon Calculator, like this tool, all of these tools are equipping us with the power of knowledge so that we can make better choices. Right now, again, in this spirit of sort of lead with we, Procter & Gamble and Walmart are working together to educate consumers about how to make better sustainable choices. Two, very, very unlikely partners. Or look at young companies. If you're a young company in New York or Russia or Sydney or Singapore, there are so, if you look around us in the natural world, we are surrounded by biological blueprints that are the product of millions of years of evolution. And if we just look to serve nature, we can actually solve for what we need in our own lives in a way that supports nature. So I'll give you an example. Modern Meadow and Bolt Threads are both developing an alternative to leather. With Bolt Threads, it's called Milo, and it's made from mycelium, mushrooms. And obviously, it has a much more positive effect on the environment than all of this industrial farming and all the animals that are killed and so on and so on. They're also decoding the DNA of spider webs and biofabricating an equivalent to make something called EcoSilk that Stella McCartney, the fashion brand, is using to make the world's first biodegradable tennis dress, where it can literally fully biodegrade. These are young companies that are starting to unlock the absolute treasures that are in the natural world that we continue to destroy every day and going to market with products that do the jobs that we need without actually harming the environment and they're looking after nature. And lastly, the One Trillion Tree Organization, which has brought together powerful coalitions from all different sectors, government, business, the public sector, and so on, all coming together to plant one trillion trees to restore you know, the capacity and ability of nature to pull carbon out of the air and to let the soil do the work that it's doing. So all of these are very, very powerful examples, and they're all over the world right now. My question for you is this, on top of the answers you've already been doing, what is one future-facing ambitious goal for your company that you can set? Some really big goal, and who's a partner that could help you get there? Who's a partner that could help you work together? So think of your business, think of your industry, think about the type of products you take to market and go, okay, what's some crazy big goal that's positive for our climate challenge future that we could set? And then you go, wow, that kind of seems impossible, but who's a partner that could help you get there? The biggest partner you can think of, because what's happening is people are working together in new ways so we can get there faster. And so the large point here is I want you to see that the whole thesis of my new book is lead with we. We all choose to lead 
because we have to. We got into this mess together and we're all going to have to show up differently to get out of it, whether we like it or not, whether it's this year, in three years time, in five years time, in seven years time or 10 years time. There is no avoiding the challenges that are coming. It's already baked in. And right now we're on a, on a trajectory for a 2.4 degrees Celsius rise in global temperature, which in their words, heads of state, climate scientists will be catastrophic. We're going to have to do it one way or not. I would like to think we do it sooner rather than later. And I don't think this is the end of something. I think this is the beginning of the most transformative, the most miraculous rebirth of business, a appropriately painful, but rebirth of business where we start to work with nature rather than against it. And nature will absolutely dazzle us with its inherent regenerative capacity. And in turn, we're going to fall in love with the natural world all over again. And what I want for you is that companies, small and large, recognize this now so we can solve for these issues sooner, but also that you can get on the right side of history. You can start to put, point your company and its collaborations in the right direction so that as the market moves this way, it's going to push you forward. And if, you're, if you wonder if that's really going to happen, think about where business was 10 years ago, how much they were talking about being purposeful on the environment and climate. Think about it five years ago, and it wasn't just Unilever and Patagonia and so on anymore. Think about it in the last two years where it's gone like this. COVID has forced us to recognize that we need to do things differently. And think about it where it's going if you look at the climate challenge and all the other issues I mentioned. It's going to go like this. And the companies that are on the right side of these market forces will succeed more than others. In fact, Bill Gates a couple of days ago said there will be 10 Teslas and a Google and a Microsoft created out of climate tech alone. All of these challenges are marketplace opportunities in disguise. And whatever you make, wherever you are in the world, the more that you can be responsible with your supply chain, your people, your products and how you market them, the better off you'll be if you know if you start sooner rather than later and so last couple of comments before we go to questions you might say all right i i, I get it we're out of time but also why is it going to happen now why would it happen now when it hasn't happened in the past i think three things are together in a way that i've never seen happen before one is the stakes we are told every day in the press that we are facing an ex existential crisis for humanity we literally will not survive. It couldn't be more important. We've got the stakeholders and we've all, you know, we've got suppliers, leaders, employees, customers, consumers, but now we have the investor class, you know, who are committed to ESG funds and that only want to support companies that are part of the problem and that are set up to survive this climate emergency. So important, the investor class is finally at the table to make these market forces possible. And then finally, we have a new story for business, whether it's Larry Fink at BlackRock, the largest money management firm in the world, the CEOs of the Business Roundtable, B Corp CEOs, all the heads of state at the World Economic Forum, Nancy Pelosi here in the US most recently, everybody is talking about a re-engineering of capitalism. Why? Because it's not serving enough people, it's not serving our future, it's not serving our planet in a way that we're going to survive. And so by leading with we, by really looking at how you can lead with as many people as possible to benefit the largest we and using that as a decision making filter, the connectivity between all of our different individual choices from the car I drive to the food I buy can work for us rather than against us. And when you go away from this, what I would love you to think is lead with we is a simple tool. It's a mindset. It's how you think I've got to lead with we. It's a practice in terms of how you get it done, how you work with others to make that a reality. And it's also an end state. It's what you're driving towards, that everyone is leading with we. And so the regenerative and therefore sustainable future that we want for ourselves, for our kids, my kids outside that door, or for, and for the planet, which we all deeply love, whether it's the mountains or the beaches or whatever it might be, is possible to restore and protect if and only if we lead with we. And so, you know, I really appreciate, Chris, the chance to share some thinking. The book came out today and I've taken the last 10 years of our work at We First and laid it in a step-by-step -step plan 
so that a company of any size, large or small, can follow the blueprint and apply it to their business so that you can drive growth by solving for these social and environmental issues. And it just came out this week. It's on Amazon. If you want more information, you can go to leadwithwe.com. And also, if you have more questions or questions about your brand or you're interested in me for speaking or consulting, you can also reach me directly on Simon at wefirstbranding.com. But I really want to thank everyone for listening and I'm going to stop sharing and we can, uh, we can go to questions. Simon, first of all, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to train the firm's consulting community. It's a rare opportunity to be able to learn from you in this workshop. And I know everyone here really appreciates your time. Of course. And thank you for doing this crucial work in the world. And what is also important to highlight is that the impact each of us can have, and this is something we mentioned in the podcast as well, and I so agree with you, the impact each of us can have is not limited to just our actions. Think about all the people you can influence, all the people for which you can become an example who will take action because they saw you taking action. And so our legacy, your legacy becomes something you can never know but it will be much bigger than you can even imagine. Yeah, I totally agree, Chris. And here's one way you can simply do that. You buy a copy of the book for yourself because it's important. You don't, you don't have time to think all this through. You haven't seen what works and doesn't work inside all these companies. And I've been very lucky to see that. So I put it in a book, but buy another copy or a couple of copies and give it to an employee, to a, to a CEO, to a founder of another company, you know, anyone, and you can just double your impact. You change yourself but also give it to somebody else. They read it and their thinking will change. And you can, it can be so, so powerful, the impact that you can have by putting the right information in the right hands and also sharing the book on social media. Just talk about Lead With We and put it out there and I'd really appreciate it. So Chris, what you're gonna say? Yes, absolutely. Definitely get a few copies. And Simon is an incredible writer. He's a New York Times bestselling author and he is unbelievably accomplished individual. We actually just had a podcast on strategy skills podcast with Simon, check it out as well. So you will know how lucky you are to have this time. We are spending with Simon today. And I also wanted to mention that as you Simon pointed out, it's not only about doing good. You can do good and also do well at the same time. Market opportunities are there for you to grab and leave your mark. Right, no one, no one is going to do it just to do good in the world. I think that's naive, it's foolish, it won't happen. But we're finally at that point where employees, customers and investors will re reward you for doing so. And that's the carrot side. The stick side is if you don't do it, they'll punish you. They'll go to somebody else. Very true. We have a question from Anastasia. She says, thank you for sharing the book and thank you, Simon, for your presentation. Simon, I have a psychology background, and I recently met guys from Potentia Workforce who help companies embrace neurodiversity in their recruitment practices that I personally found really inspiring, but less common for companies to address. How would you approach embracing changes that demand greater education than more popular ESG practices? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it's almost like a, a subset of ESG or DNI issues. Like, how do you make sure that a company is bringing the right diversity to their workforce? You know, the way that people think, you know, um, the, the, the different ideas that they have, because I think a lot in, in a lot of ways, companies are guilty of having old white guys at the top. And the longer a company stays in business, the more it tries to manage the business which means keep things the same, then lead the business and self disrupt. And so neurodiversity is so important in recruitment practices, because you want different ways of thinking. And so there's an education piece there to help companies understand why it's so important. You need to make the business case to them in terms of what they're willing to listen to. If you just go in there and say you should do this and here's why they're going to go Oh my God, like don't tell us what to do. We've got enough problems as it is. But if you go into them and you say, and you recognize what are they thinking about? It might be a loss of talent. It might be reputation damage. It might be trying to improve the whole industry because it's under attack. 
It might be, you know, how to strengthen your culture in the time of COVID. If you go into a conversation with them and say, based on these needs, their needs, here's what neurodiversity could do for you. Here's what a more diverse workforce could do to you and reverse engineer out of what they're already trying to solve for rather than trying to give them another problem they don't have time or money for. And so I think, you know, the neurodiversity is so important, this diversity of thought and thinking inside a company, and it can be applied to any of the issues they're trying to solve for because every company needs ideas and innovation and creativity and so on. But make sure, start with them and where they're at, reverse engineer out of that, explain what you're offering and the benefits it will have. And you'll find very quickly, simply by shifting the focus to them, rather than what you're trying to sell, you'll get a much more effective result. Absolutely. Simon, and what advice would you give to our participants today here and for everyone who will be watching the replay in terms of what can they do tomorrow morning differently? To, sorry, to model? What can they do tomorrow morning at 8 a.m.? to try to start incorporating your advice? The first thing you need to, here are some very, very simple steps. Number one, choose to lead. Choose to lead. That means you're gonna to have to work out whether you wanna be part of the solution or you're just gonna let the problem continue and see what happens. So choose to lead. That sounds really simple, but you have to make that choice. Whether you're in payroll, in you know accounting, whether you're in, R&D, it doesn't matter. Are you going to be someone who says, you know what, I can see that we're in trouble. I can see that our business will be better served by doing something about it. Here's my suggestion. That's number one. Number two, do an audit on your business to see where you're exposed to risk. This is really valuable to the business, no matter what. Is it your suppliers? Is it how you're treating your people? Is it about you know, the type of products you're taking to market? Identify where the risk is and then ask yourself, how could we improve that? What's a better material that we could use? You're seeing companies all day long, either now do carbon offsets to reduce their carbon footprint, to find different you know, materials to make their products out of, like Ikea to take products back, to have a circular economy. They're all trying to think through how to de-risk their company. So choose to lead, self audit, and then third, define why you exist, define your company purpose as it applies to your entire company, from your supply chain, to your employees, to your marketing and your products, and to your community impact work. Just do those three things. Choose to lead, self-audit, define your purpose. That will give you enough to go with, you know, to start on. And then if you want to go deeper, you want all the research, you want the examples, you want the plan to follow, it's all in the book. That's why I created the book. It's not about moving books, it's about moving people's minds and hearts and behaviors in a direction that is going to serve all of our futures. And, you know, I'm really lucky. I get to see what's working. We're in, a, we're in these companies C-suite 95% of the time. We hear the conversations, we see what's going on, we see what works. And we just thought if we package that all up for you in a step-by-step -step way, it would save you all the trouble and then we can scale our impact by getting it in your hands. Simon, you know, sometimes we get messages from our clients saying that, I really resonate with your message about making a mark in the world and trying to do work that creates a positive impact, but I don't feel I'm in a position to do so. And then no. they will list the situation. And from my perspective, they're in such a great position to do so. And they're, they're light years ahead from where yeah. I was starting when I started my career. What would you say to listeners like yeah, that? Yeah, it's a very understandable feeling where you're like, um, I want to make things better. I want us to do more good, but no one's going to listen to me. I don't have the power. I don't have the control. So what can I do? And unfortunately for many people, then they go, well, I'm going to give up or I'm just going to hope it's going to work out. But here's what you do. And I've seen this time and time again inside large and small companies. Three things. One, make the business case by showing your leadership team the research. If you want to see the bottom line P&L benefits to a company by being purposeful, look at the Deloitte Purpose Premium Report. Deloitte is one of the largest, you know, most respected consulting firms out there. 
you know, it's called Purpose Premium and all the benefits are laid out there. So the business case is there. Number two, do a competitive audit. Have a look at your competitors and see what they're doing that's purposeful and impactful. And just list that out. Just take the top six or eight competitors in your industry, B2B, B2C, and list out what they're doing. And that will start to awaken other people's competitive instinct. They're like, wait a second, if our competitor's doing it or this person's doing it, you know, maybe there's something in it. And then thirdly, and this is so important, do a cost benefit analysis. You've got to treat it like a business issue. What's the cost of doing it to fix your supply chain, to fix how you treat your people, to fix your product? What's the cost? You know, just take a stab at it. And then what is the benefit of doing it to your reputation, to your culture, to your product and sales with younger demographics? But then here's the kicker. Do a cost benefit analysis of not doing it. So what's the cost of not doing it? Damaging your reputation, losing employees, customers going somewhere else. And what's the benefit of not doing it? Well, it'll save us time, it'll save us money, things like that. If you lay out the business case with the research, you do a competitive audit of other people out there and what they're doing in your industry, and then you do a cost benefit analysis for doing it and not doing it, in my experience, companies invariably wake up and go, if, even if, if not that day, three days, four days later, they're like, hmm, let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit more because they're competitive, because they don't want to be exposed to risk, because they see the business case from a source they direct, they, they respect, and then it'll slowly take on a life of its own. But you've got to take the risk and choose to lead in the first place. That's why it's lead with we. And this is such an important advice. And generally, whenever you look at return on investment, always also take a look at return mm -hmm. on inaction. What right. happens if you don't take action? Exactly, Actually, exactly. Eye-opening when you do that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. People think I'm safer if I don't have a point of view on these issues or I don't say anything. But if you look at Edelman's Trust Barometer report, 78 to 80 percent of consumers expect CEOs and companies to have a point of view on political or social issues, not business issues, political or social. And if they don't, 70% will penalize the brand and 20% will leave and never come back. 20% of your customers will leave and never come back. And you just think you're being safer because you're saying nothing. It's not true. And just think millennials and Gen Z, like they're like 40 years old and down now. All they've ever heard growing up is that the world is on fire. They are looking now and saying, are you part of the problem or are you part of the solution? And that's only going to increase. Simon, thanks again for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the opportunity. And I so respect everyone who's shown up and invested their time here. I want nothing more for you than dramatic and sustained growth in your business. And we just happen to be at a moment in time where solving for these issues and showing up responsibly will accelerate your business growth. And on the other side, by not doing that, it can really hurt your business. So this is all about the health, success and profit of your business. So I would invite you, you know, get Lead With We, go to leadwithwe.com, go to Amazon, get it in other people's hands. This won't work if we don't do it together. That's why I'm so adamant about it. We have to do it together. And Chris, thank you so much for the opportunity to share some thinking with the community. I really appreciate it. And we appreciate, Simon, you taking the time so much as well. Make sure you support Simon if you can support the book today, because when it comes out, it's the most important time to support the book Thank so you. that the book can be seen by more people who need to see it. And this can be you becoming a part of the solution. We appreciate you all very much. Have a great rest of your day, and we will speak to you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.